Hello and welcome everyone to the Three Principles Global Community webinar. The Three Principles Global Community, or 3PGC, is a nonprofit organization that's committed to bringing an understanding of the three principles to people throughout the world. Today, we have Wynne Morgan with us. Wynne is a Three Principles practitioner based in Windsor, UK, and works with corporations and individuals around the world. Having stumbled across the Three Principles almost seven years ago, he's completely changed his relationship to his own life and with himself. Having been in the people development world for the past 18 years within organizations and as a consultant with his own business for the past 10 years, he graduated from Michael Neal's Super Coach program in 2012 and continued to work with Michael and later with George and Linda Pramsky and Barb Patterson's mentorship program. He is currently on the faculty of Super Coach 2017 and loves to share what's going on behind the scenes of the human experience to people from every walk of life and in every corner of the globe. Wynne is a patriotic Welshman, and given how much he travels, is thankful to still be like a big kid when he gets on a plane. I like that. <laughs> so Wynne is going to talk about Shouldn't I Know Better by Now? And Wynne, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Well, thanks, Brooke. Thanks for that. Um, it's amazing when you're either asked to write or you ask somebody else to write a a kind of biography and what seems to sound strange back when someone else reads it and what seems to be oh yeah that's that's really accurate so that's what struck me right now um so hello everyone um good to see a lot of very familiar faces and some faces that are a little less familiar um so as you've just heard from brooke and what you'll have read um, about this webinar i've just been noticing how many times in coaching other coaches or coaching other practitioners or general Joe public, how many of us get caught up in that whole stream of thinking that by now, shouldn't I do better, know better, all of that kind of story. Um, and I've been hearing a lot of that from my clients recently. And that's what struck me as would be a good topic to discuss um, with us all. So, Predominantly, this is for um, practitioners. Although, if you're not a practitioner and you're listening into the recording or anything, that's absolutely fine too. Um, yeah, um, yeah. Bonnie, not Brooke, who's running the show here, and the reason is I just had both names written on a piece of paper in front of me because I need to drop somebody else a note. So, um, Bonnie, thanks very much for the introduction. Good. Well, just as long as you got that nice bit nice and straight right now. So it's probably worthwhile just sharing my own story um, for a few minutes anyway, just to give an understanding as to what I'm seeing and where I was coming from. Um, so as Bonnie mentioned, I, I stumbled across this seven years ago and literally it was stumbling. I'd been struggling with quite a few things in, in, in my life. And while outwardly my life looked really cool, awesome, that, um, corporations would be paying me an awful lot of money to go and and help them you know ship me into various places and fly me into countries and 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 help that that geography and and then they you know pay for me to go and see the Taj Mahal because I happen to be in central India or I'd be in Beijing so they'd get me a guide for a day on my free day and show me the Great Wall of China and all of these amazing things that were happening in my life and outwardly my life looked really cool and it didn't feel like that. Uh, it really felt very different to me. Although clearly there were some really nice times and some nice moments, it was interspersed with an awful lot of angst as to who I was as a human being, who I was as a man, and what I was looking to achieve. Um, and as a, as a seeker of more inner peace and looking to be fixed, because I did think that there was something up with the way I was feeling and seeing the world and my life, I was going through lots of training in NLP and so forth and, and stumbled across um, a gentleman by the name of Michael Neal, who was running some training um, with one of the founders of NLP, Richard Bandler, and, and a gentleman called Paul McKenna who was very well known here in the UK. And so it was Paul McKenna, Richard Bandler, 
um, and, a, and a guy called Michael Neal doing the training. And I clearly knew the other two names very well. I'd never met them before, but I didn't really know Michael. Never even heard of him. Um, so I went on the training and I enjoyed it. Um, I thought I was on the right track, thinking that that would be helping me fix other people and helping me fix myself too. And while I enjoyed listening and, and interacting with um, Paul and with Richard, it was this other gentleman, Paul, um, Michael Neal, who I was really drawn more to. And it took a while for me to figure out that it was where he was coming from, not what he was so much saying. He was coming from a place of more deeper sincerity is where I would describe it as now, a dozen years later. So I followed Michael's career then through the latter half of um, the previous decade. And he would be publishing books and um, CD series and so forth. And then after I turned 40, I was going to have two weeks vacation in California, a week in San Francisco, um, seeing old friends and, and my favorite NFL team, the 49ers, and also a week in Los Angeles. And in that time in Los Angeles for the week, I arranged to have a half-day session one-on-one -on -one with Michael Neal. So this was December 2010. And by that time, Michael was talking about things in a very different way than what I'd heard him when he was training me in NLP. And quite frankly, I didn't like what he was saying. I didn't understand it. I thought it was crazy. I thought he was on the wrong track. And I thought, frankly, I'd waste a lot of money. Um, that was my experience. And really what I do know now was I was just very busy in my mind thinking a certain way and I was very solid in what was going on up in here which is kind of laughable given what happened next so after our what four hours together or pretty much me disagreeing with everything he said and thought as I left his house I said if you do that coaching program starting in January 2012 which was 13 months after this event I'll be there, which surprised me that I was saying that given my experience for the afternoon, but clearly I must have seen something. And what was really striking to me was that by August of 2011, things had really started to elevate in my business. And I was feeling more free and I, I wasn't so stuck up in my head about certain ideas that I thought were just fundamental truths. And, and Michael did challenge them, and it was something about what he said clearly that I saw a link between um, me getting a little bit more lucid in my head and the performance of my business. So much so that in that August, I'd had a, you know, already a fantastic year, and I paid up for 2012 Supercoach and bought my entire flights for the, for the six months. So I was in. Curious, confused, but all in. Which is a nice thing to know that as little as I knew, there was something else pulling the strings of, of this puppet here, which is a nice thing to notice in my mind today. But as caught up as, a, as I was then, I still saw something deeper. Probably come back to that in a while. So fast forward to January 2012 and Supercoach started. And then Supercoach was a program where there'd be a weekend every month for six months. So. January, February, March, April, May, June, June, June. Yeah, that would be six. And I went along in January and I really enjoyed it and made some really good contacts and you know, good connections with other people, other students. Made some really good friends very quickly and enjoyed the conversation of whatever was being taught and talked about. I was intrigued by, well, we're going to have a conversation about the nature of the human experience. I thought that was a really cool conversation to have. But I didn't get it, not at all. Didn't understand what was being said. And February came and uh, that was George Pransky and Linda Pransky came and I enjoyed them, but I didn't understand what they were saying. But I didn't notice that other people were being affected. Other people's lives, my fellow students, they were seeing things differently and experiencing an awful lot more, what I'd now call psychological freedom and more you know, freedom of mind and freedom of spirit and, they were seeing their life really differently. And that just kept me intrigued. 
And March came and I saw more of the same for me, nothing, and for them, more changes. And April, all the same. By now I'm thinking four months out of six gone of this program, I'm flying a third of the way around the world and an eight hour time difference. I'm giving up pretty much a quarter of my time to do this and I'm not getting anything from it. I thought that was um, now starting to be a bit concerning. And I had a conversation with Michael about it while he was in London and effectively what transpired as a result of that you know, very informal conversation is that I saw that I was using my thinking to see my thinking, which makes no sense to me right now. So it was like me drowning and drinking more water. That, that would be the way I experienced it or the way I now rationalize what I was trying to do, which makes absolutely zero sense. And it was really good that I saw it. And later that day, I was taking a car, a road trip in the car from London up to Sheffield, a three hour drive. And at some point early in that journey, I thought, I wonder what it would be like if I stopped trying to think and figure this out. Well, literally by the time I got there three hours later, my thinking had dropped to, a, to an extent where I could see through it. I could see through a part of the illusion that I had innocently created about who I was, what was going on in life and how my experience was created, which is a really cool thing to notice. I also, I'm pretty sure had that thought up until that day that I thought I needed to have everything figured out. I thought that I wouldn't feel bad again. I thought I, thought I wouldn't feel confused again. I thought I wouldn't feel low again. And I kind of saw through that too. So dropping my expectations of quite a bit about how I would feel, probably for the very first time that day, it helped loosen things up in my own mind to see more about what was going on. And, and that really has carried on for quite a while since. So that would have been now as the time of this as we're all together here it's towards the end of April now 2017 so it's five years ago given a, in a week's time that that conversation happened and the first time I really saw something more deeply about mind thought and consciousness about how my experience as a human being is created I saw something in that five years ago and in carry on Carrying on going deeper, I had an intensive in Lacona with Bob Patterson, who's been a, an amazing friend and a mentor and coach over this last kind of five and a half years. And in that intensive in Lacona, and I guess that would have been 2014, I thought that what this understanding would do would make me immune to feeling bad that I'd be over feeling bad. I, I would not have bad experiences again. And I would control, effectively control my experience. That's where I was at. And when it was made very clear to me that that wasn't on offer, I really hated the idea of what this could actually do <laughs> for me and for anybody else. I thought, well, what's this for? What's these three principles for then if that's, if that's not it? And well, I'm glad I kept going beyond that because what I now see is far better than any version of control I could have even imagined a few years ago, which is a really nice thing to notice. What's better than being in control? <laughs> That's a phrase I didn't think I'd ever be able to say, yet alone really know. And over the last few years, it's been a wonderful deeper explanation or exploration of what that really means for me and everybody else, all 7 billion of us on this planet, about what's really going on behind the scenes of our behavior, behind the scenes of our feelings, behind the scenes of this matter and energy, this matter, this energy that we're all 
a part of together. And there are times as a part of the human condition that I can feel so free, so at peace, so connected. And knowing that my circumstances have nothing to do with how I'm feeling, nothing to do with them. And often it looks like that. And even when it looks like that, I'm grateful for now being forever superstitious or suspicious even, should I say. Suspicious that that's really just how I'm seeing things and I don't trust how I'm seeing things when what I'm feeling is a little bit off. I love being suspicious of that. And within an instant of me feeling that much peace and connection, I can then get really stuck in my thinking about what shirt to wear in the morning. Because at that moment, it looks like it really matters. And I think that's a perfect description in my mind right now about what it's like in the human condition to go from what's really going on to then being completely human in the humdrum of daily life. Will I make that train on time? Will the person next to me on this plane have a cold that I will catch? What will happen if the ride isn't there when I land? All of those kind of things can really occupy my mind and look really solid and real as if they matter in a moment and then disappear in an instant too. And that's a really fun thing to notice. A really fun thing to notice. What I think is also really cool in the way that I described this to a group of people that me and my colleague, John L. Mokadem, were, were taking a group of people through this understanding over the weekend. And what I saw before starting the second day was what we're often up to and thinking that is really wise for us as human beings is first of all, clearly we think that how we feel comes from circumstances, right? We're kind of bombarded with messages from that and conditioned that it's an outside in world. And, and it's okay to get lost in that and thinking, for, you know, now and again, even for all of us, right? We've been looking in this direction for a, even a few weeks or months or years. It's okay to get tricked by that because it's gonna trick us. Thoughts compelling can be really compelling. So it looks like for all the world at times we need to manage our circumstances. And why we're in this conversation is that we deep down know that that's not true. Even if it's possible to manage circumstances, it's not the source of our experience anyway. So why would that even? be a good thing to do. So there's an awful lot of freedom there of letting go of the notion of managing circumstances. But then there's the other thing of what we then try and do, and this is from my own experience, and this is possibly why I'm seeing it a lot for other people too, is that, okay, so I'm not gonna manage my circumstances, but how I feel right now really sucks. So there's something wrong with that. So why don't I manage, learn to manage or learn to even control how I feel? Wouldn't that be a really good idea? Because I don't like feeling bad. Why don't I try and control or manage that? Well, what's interesting for me right now is to know that that is as ridiculous a notion for me as it is to try and manage and control circumstance. It's impossible. And not necessary not necessary at all. And when we see experiences and experience and a feeling from just being a feeling that comes from our moment by moment relationship with our thinking, nothing to do with who we are, nothing to do with what we're up to, not a reflection on 
how well we're doing as a human being at all. Only information about what's going on in our mind and our relationship with the, with the state of mind, really. That's even more freeing. So let me say that differently. Let me say that another way. What I noticed was that when I was starting to feel tight, insecure, afraid, lacking confidence, whatever it may well be a feeling that I don't like that seems to reflect back on me as in how I'm doing, then really what's happening is, is that my mind's closing in. That this is how I'm seeing things, the aperture of where my vision is, is closing down. And that's really what's the only cause of me having a, a genuinely tight feeling going on. But this has nothing to do with what I'm doing. And I've got no blame nor control over this. My ebb and flow of the mind, it's going to do this constantly when I'm going to see things really clearly and with amazing perspective here. And then sometimes it's going to look like this. And we all know the impact of having a mind like this. But I'm not responsible for the mind doing its thing. It's an ebb and flow. It would be the same as when King Canute was told that even, even the tide would listen to him and you could you know, send the tide back and make it not flow. Well, it's the same for us in our mind. It's going to ebb and flow. Yet, when we start to learn this understanding or, or any kind of way of, of helping people understand their own psychology, all of a sudden, we put ourselves in a different place. We tend to think that, well, given what I do and what I know and how much time, money, or effort I've spent looking in this direction, that I shouldn't feel bad anymore. And I shouldn't get caught up. And wow, who am I? What on earth can I do as a practitioner or somebody helping people with this understanding when I can't get my stuff together either? Well, us not getting our stuff together means nothing other than the fact we're having a human experience. And we're not immune to that and never will be. It's a description of the human experience, not the, not the solution or the transcendence of it. In my mind, as I'm saying this out loud to you all right now, So I'm going to say a, a quick story about somebody that I talked to, which probably why I had this idea of why this might be a useful topic to discuss today. So someone I knew or have known for probably 15 years now, and he's a very experienced therapist, NLP practitioner, um, has dabbled, I think, with the principles. And she's read quite a few of the books, but I don't think she's gone on many of the trainings. But for her, she would be looking in to understand human psychology in order for her to transcend it and to not feel bad again. And if we're doing that and then we do feel bad, we think there's something wrong with us. As opposed to seeing the fact that we're just human. All of us are the same. We all have our own, the exact same operating system that this is gonna happen, then we're gonna feel bad. And then what sometimes is up for grabs is what we make of how we feel. And if I make up or buy into the story up, because while I'm feeling a certain way, it means this. It means that I shouldn't. It means that I should be beyond this. It means that I, there's something wrong with me. Then that's the bit in my mind that's optional. And that's the part that we can, with more 
deeper grounding starts seeing through more often. The part that me at my most insecure, me at my most neurotic, is just me being human, having a human moment, responding to nothing other than the relationship I've got with the content of my thinking. And I'm going to say that again, my relationship with the content of my thinking. I'm not seeing the content of my thinking. I'm having a relationship issue with my content of my thinking. Because I know that we can all have this same thought on a Tuesday at 1.30 in the afternoon. This same thought at 2.45 on a Wednesday afternoon. And it doesn't feel the same. So to me, it's not even a thought created feeling or a feeling that comes directly from our thinking. It comes from the relationship with our thinking. It's that part that is not just thought, it's thought plus consciousness. It's consciousness that makes this thought seem more or less real. And that's why I love that whole notion of it's consciousness that brings this whole thing, my thinking to life. And there's no cure for a varying level of consciousness. It doesn't mean anything, then I'm just having a human moment. And every moment I'm ever going to have is a human moment, <laughs> as far as I'm aware. Now, the lady I mentioned a few minutes ago, when we had this kind of conversation, that she was quite caught up in thinking that she should now know better to therefore do better and not feel bad again. But she saw something not quite real and true about that, that she put herself off the hook as a member again of the human race. That she's in the same boat as all the rest of us, regardless of how enlightened we think we may be or how unenlightened we may think we may be. We're all the same. We're all the same. And I know for me, when I saw in my own experience, when I let go of me having expectations about how I would feel or expectations about managing my consciousness or managing my thinking, and then let everything just do its thing because I'm not going to control it. I'm not going to manage it. It's a fool's errand to try to put my attention or my energy there. It's an amazing thing to understand I'm off the hook. And in seeing the fact that I'm off that hook and in the same boat as all the rest of us, it means I'm really free to experience being human. Including days that I'd rather not have. Including hours that seem to be a really dark hour. Including three minutes that look like, well, when you suck. What do you know? What are they going to think to that? All that kind of story that I might have for 10 seconds, three minutes, three hours or three months, it doesn't seem to matter so much to me anymore. Apart from, of course, in the few minutes that it does, but I still know deep down, deep down, that what I'm feeling has got nothing to do with what's going on out there. And it's just me having an experience. What's also funny for me to notice as well is when I'm when I see this for myself and talk to other people about just that. About I should know better by now, shouldn't I? We think everyone else is fine so often. We see their innate wellness. We see that they will always bounce back. We don't buy into their story. But ours for us looks real. 
they're fine. Me? No, I can't feel bad. So again, one funny thing that I tend to notice that was true for me for quite a while and true for lots of others. But when we just get wise to that, clearly that makes no sense. It makes no sense on a human level. No sense at all on a human level where we think they're fine having their experience, but we're not having, we're not fine having ours. That's a really, for me, that was a really cool insight for me to share with somebody and for them to see that for themselves. Okay, well, that's what I wanted to share to begin with. I'd love this to be interactive as these webinars with the three PGC um, so often are, and that's when they do become really valuable. So I'd love your questions, your comments on what you've seen in what I've said. Hi, Wen, this is Christy. Hi, Christy. So as you were talking a couple things, so I have a question, but just in my own experience. So I was actually crying when you were talking. <laughs> so, but it was actually okay. So, and that was that. Um, what are you experiencing right now? That's my question. Is that a question directly to me when Morgan, my experience or on a human level? However you hear that inside to answer that. Like I said, you're, you, right now you're, the, you're presenting. Mm -hmm. So I was just curious as to what that's like for you. Well, most of the time in the last half an hour, I've not been aware of presenting. I've just been sharing what I see. And in that time as well, it did occur to me that I was seeing all of these faces on my computer screen. And, well, I better be able to add some value because there's people here spending their time on this. Well, I was coming in and going out. And then when you said I was crying and that's okay, well, I thought, first of all, is Christy crying because she felt something beautiful? And then she said, but it's okay. And I'm thinking, well, no, it must mean it was bad. What have I said and done? What's going on with her? All of that was coming up for me in my thinking. What I do know, though, and what's different now than what, a, what it would have been maybe even a year ago, certainly different from two or three years ago, is that how much more free my thinking looks to me now. Is that when it's coming it's coming through and going coming through and going and my experience is a as an ebb and flow of that as a complete shadow of what i'm thinking is a nice thing to notice that i am free to think and feel absolutely anything so what's been my experience hugely varying in the last half an hour including as I'm trying to explain this. Because from, from my end, it, for me, it's quiet. I like listening to you. I appreciate all the conversations that we've had. So anytime there's an opportunity to listen to you, I will. And so I have, I have my own image and my own experience of what it's like, but I was curious to know what it's like for you as, as, as for me, as someone 
entering onto the other side of that conversation of, of sharing the understanding. That's why I wanted to ask. In the now. Yeah. Well, there's, there's a few things in that as well, Christian, for all of us, I think, is that what's loosened up for me as well and what comes up from that question is that my view of myself has very little resemblance to other people's view of me. And you know, there's somebody on this call who I remember having a conversation with a year and a half or two years ago. And, and, and they were just saying to me how confident I was and how together I was. And I thought, well, you can't be talking about me, surely. And then, you know, other people notice about, but when you're so calm, you're so collected, I'm thinking, well, sometimes, sometimes I'm not confident, sometimes I'm not calm. Most of the time I'm not aware of either, I'm just living my life. And given the fact that for a lot of my life, I was looking for tips, tricks, and techniques and tools in order for me to feel more confident, I find that really interesting, but it's now clearly an absurd notion for me to go out there in order for me to feel more confident, given the fact that I know where confidence comes from and the fact that it's a made up notion of what other people see, nothing to do with me. And I remember in, in me giving corporate training, me being really stuck in my head over something and feeling terrible inside. And this is going back less than a year, me feeling pretty much as if, well, that's the end of that. My dreams are over, right? That kind of heartbreak. And knowing nobody else had an idea, knowing that that had no impact on how I was coming across, knowing it had no impact at all on my experience of me. And why I love the question that you asked, now I understand what's behind the question is, we're all that free. We're all that free to have our own internal experience and whether we're sharing or not, we can have anything going on. When we know that that's got nothing to do with what we're actually saying and, and what they're experiencing from us. I find that cool. What do you hear in my answer the last few minutes? <laughs> how easy it can get, how easily I can get wrapped up in the content. Meaning if this is supposed to be a, a, a conversation for practitioners and I should know better, that it's still just a conversation. And that, that's what occurred to me. So. Well, and given that this is always going to be a conversation when we're sharing this about the human experience, then any experience that we're having in that moment is perfectly far valid, perfectly okay to share. Right. Or not share, depending on what occurs to us. And, and it's amazing to me how often my worst days at the time end up being the source of my greatest insight and the things that someday I share to other people and what they hear in that can be one of theirs too. It doesn't mean that, well, let me turn this negative into a positive. I don't even need to do that. Okay, that's taken care of. It'll occur to me at some point that maybe that's something to share with somebody. And that might be an amazing thing that they will hear in that that helps to free them. That helps them see something deeper. Yeah, 
Yeah, what what you're sharing is like I was feeling pretty not well the last well for several days in in the recent past, but it was only when I started feeling better that the insights came, and then I couldn't stop the uh, the <laughs> there was a bunch of them, but only when the when it, things started to pass. So, and if there's insight about insight, I had to move on to the next, I had to move on to the next context, if you will. And so all I did was note them, but even about whether or not I shared them, I may, I may, and I may not, because it's, I'm kind of in the now, now. So, um, yeah. So now I'm starting to have insights about insights, I guess. Or I'm noticing something different about insights. That's cool to notice. Yeah. Well, let me know what happens as a result of that. Okay. We'll talk. I'm sure we will. Yes, we'll talk. Thank you, Wynn. Okay, you're more than welcome. Yeah. Andrew, it looks like you were unmuted. Something that you want to say? Oh, am I unmuted now? You are. Oh, great. Oh, man, thank you. That was, um, I, thanks for sharing your story. That was really um, beautiful. It was really helpful. I really appreciate it. Hey, what's showing up for me? I'm curious about this thing and maybe hopefully it's not off topic, but um, so I notice when I and other people, I'm going to start with the animals and then we're going to talk human to human. When I'm having an experience, let's say of unsettledness or anger that my animals respond to that. So, um, <clears throat> And I've also noticed that um, gosh, that you can one can sense another person's not always, of course, you can't like I could be presenting and think, man, I suck, and everybody could be having the experience like, wow, this is great, right? I'm not talking about that, but let's say um, sort of having uh, uh, Let's say let's anger is a good one just feeling really anger and people sensing that or feeling that what i'm curious about that what do you make up about that what do you make of that the fact that other people can notice if we're angry not behaving anger you know not punching or hitting right but having an internal your own internal experience and it's sort of porting over or you know it, very clearly, I work with horses and, and uh, like Brad, with executives, and the horses often can um, sense how a person's, what they're experiencing, right? Yeah. So how does that relate to what we're talking to, or does it? Oh, well, the real short answer is I don't really know, but I'm going to give it my best shot about what I think. Cool. Okay? But this is not my area of expertise at all, Okay. But, and I do think it's there with humans too, to a, to a certain extent, is that we tend to pick things up. We tend to be far more intuitive than we may anticipate, but that doesn't make us mind readers. Right. It doesn't make us mind readers. And, but what, what I do know for the first time about you know, you talked about horses. About a year ago, I sat on the back of a horse for the first time in 30 years. And before I sat on the horse, I fell in love with the horse. And I'm pretty sure, sure the horse knew. <laughs> right? Which, which made the next hour's trek awesome. And, that, and I knew that the horse wasn't going to fight me. I just knew. And it just felt to me as if the horse knew how much I really appreciated the, the opportunity for that horse to bear my weight in, and take me on a track through the sands on a beach. 
Mm -hmm. I kind of got a sense that we had some kind of connection. Now, I'm not an expert in what that means, other than there's something bigger at work than our cognitive awareness. There is something bigger at work than my IQ mm -hmm. from my frontal lobe, frontal lobes, I'd like to think both of them are working. And, and I don't pretend to know what that means other than I'm pretty sure it's true. Yeah, that's very true for me. And I'm curious about it in terms of this exploration. I think Michael talks about it, at least this is how I interpret. He talks about transformative presence, which it, to me is in that domain. Hmm. Right? What is that? You know, but <clears throat> like just with me, with you, you know, I experience uh, unconditional, I make up these terms, but uh, appreciation, unconditional love, connection, whatnot. Now, Am I actually experiencing that or I'm just making all that shit up in my head, you know? No, well, you're not making that stuff up in your head, right? You're not with me. I know that. Yeah, I know that too. And, and yet what's interesting to know is and what I find really interesting in this, okay, that I might have unconditional love from my mother's dog. And yet there are times in my head, I might not like my mother's dog because he did something I didn't like. Right. And in my head, I'm then thinking something about poor little Zach, right? And yet when I'm not in my thinking about what a dog needs to be like or what Zach should behave and what he should do, I'm back in unconditional love. Mm -hmm. Now that's the bit that I've got any kind of sense over is my own experience of another entity. That, that to me, regardless of who I'm with, if they, even if they are completely consistent with their unconditional love, my feelings towards them is gonna go up and down mm -hmm. based upon what I is now would explain as the relationship I've got to my thinking in the moment. And when I'm not tied up into my own thinking, then that connection is there unconditionally. And I've got a chance of then experiencing it from, from their side to what looks like the mirror. Mm -hmm. Looks like the mirror. I don't really know. I have no idea if that's the answer that you wanted or if it helps in any way, Andrew. I wasn't, well, I wasn't looking for an answer. It's a, it's an exploration I'm in. It's a curiosity that I'm having, cool. you know, and it's something I've been exploring my whole life and it's there for me. And now in exploring, you know, the three principles and whatnot, it's still there for me. I'm just curious. I'm just curious. That's all. Which is a lovely place to be. Yeah. And what I do know is, is just remaining curious. You're going to see more. Yeah. That's nice. Andrew, and thank I, you. Very I thought it would be fun to be curious with you about it. So cool. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Cool. You're welcome. Thank you. So we've got time for one or two more. So it's me again, if it's hey. okay to go. Sure. Uh, so with what Andrew was saying, you know, I was remembering something with what, what one of my mentors has said, which is that we are always loving one another because that's what we are. So, you know, I sort of think of image like self image as the collection of thoughts that I may have about somebody. And when that's not in the way, then love is what's there. But Love is my experience, not what's there, pardon me. But 
I really appreciated that his reminder to me has been, we're always loving one another because that's what we are. The form changes, whether it's a relationship or not a relationship, and our image of someone may change. Um, but can you speak to, so the thing that came up with what Andrew was sharing, can you speak to what your sense is about the power of thought? Because that's what popped into my head about when we're around other people. I have that the same experience, animals, dogs, you know, the feeling of it. But can you speak to what your understanding is of the power of thought? Now, do you mean the power of thought for me in my own mind? Or do you mean the transference? Because that's what it, I don't know if that's what you mean. My experience of somebody else's thought or tell me more about Wait, what, what, what do you... Because that this is the the newer area for me of understand of the understanding is what is the power of thought and yeah I don't think I want to say any more than that it's just that's what popped into my head when Andrew was speaking. Well, what I kind of wonder about thought and it's still my wondering about thought is that the power of the principle of thought is infinite okay uh, to me it's an amazing creative potential every idea that's been formed and unformed comes from thought thought to me right now is the power behind what creates galaxies what makes a black hole appear from a supernova what makes the matter of you and i and everybody else here be animated into a place where we can have an experience and then communicate with each other about that experience which for me is a complete miracle that's a miracle. And the fact that here we are in different parts of the world all together are seeing each other and speaking about this. Well, thought created all of that. It created Zoom. It created the internet. It created the screen. It creates the way that I am able to hear you, to see you, to appreciate all the faces I've got in front of me. I thought none of that would matter. No. And even if I did, I couldn't experience it. So that's my short way of explaining that I think it's infinite, the power of thought. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more. Lisa. Um, hi, I'm Lisa. Um, this is my first webinar, so I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Um, it was really interesting. The other day I was talking to my therapist about the power of thought. And one of the wonderful things that she told me with everything that I'm going through right now is how important it is to quiet, to just go and quiet down and get out of all those thoughts and be able to get into that place of really not thinking at all and just enjoying the moment, whether that be 
I'm in Hawaii. So whether that be watching the ocean or taking my dog on a walk or just simply laying down in bed and meditating, um, that it's in that quietness that I can finally realize how powerful that thought is, whether it's putting me in a good place or a bad place. Um, and how being quiet enables me to have the insights. If that, if that makes any sense, I, I'm fairly new to the three principles. I've been a therapist for many, many years. I teach online psychology courses that are the old typical way of thinking. Um, and so it's kind of been a battle for me to go between, okay, I got to teach Freud and Young and cognitive behavioral therapy. And then I get to go to my own therapy, which is based on the three principles, so, <laughs> which is a vast difference. Um, and um, it's, it's been interesting for me to learn this. Uh, I just feel like this is a miracle. I wish I would have learned this a long time ago. Um, because I can see how it would have changed my practice. Uh, and I've also noticed how it's changed the way I, t I teach. Uh, but it's really amazing when I find myself getting wrapped up in the, I, I don't know if I'm confident, I don't know if I'm doing well. Um, that precious message that she has sent me to just turn it off, you know, get out of the mind and find that in an innate health that's inside of me and spend the moments there because then I can come back out and enjoy the moment itself instead of being so wrapped up in my thoughts. Does that, does that make sense? It makes a heap of sense. And, and clearly that's having a really, by the sound of it, a really positive impact on you. Is yeah. that when things are quieter on the inside, then you can notice what's really going on in the moment. Yes. I think the only, the only thing that I would say, if, if I am personally on a mission to quieten my mind, I'm pretty much doomed to fail. Because that to me looks like another thing to do. I'm going to quiet my mind. It's given me more things to think about, not less. Yes. Now, the best way I know for being more quiet more often is delving into the deeper understanding as to how the mind works. And me doing less mind management means that mind in all of its amazing innate health and innate quietness can bubble up when I'm trying to mess with it less. <laughs> Including one mission being quiet and down mind. Let me be still, let me be in the moment. Well, hasn't tended to be that effective for me. And, and there are some times when I meditate that I can get into a meditative state, but I, I know I'm equally able to because that's how the mind works, that I can get into a meditative state on a train, in the shower, running a webinar, <laughs> or or making a pot of coffee. That is not circumstantial. I don't have to do that. The mind will do that itself. When I see that it can. Yeah. I've noticed that too. Mm. Making my coffee this morning. I can't believe I'm up at 6 a.m. <laughs> Um, but that's true. You know, the mind can be quiet, just walking the dog or sitting here listening to you, you know, my mind shuts off and, and I'm able to be in that moment. And it can be quiet. at the stars last night, uh, you know, hmm. anything. Yeah. A quiet mind can happen anywhere and it can happen in some pretty, what look like trying circumstances, outside circumstances, what looks like, well, I can't have a quiet mind there. Well, well, it can happen. I've been in some yeah. amazingly beautiful still places where my mind's gotten really busy. I remember being on a yacht just off um, Waikiki just over a year ago, 
and wondering why my mind got really busy and revved up. Because I shouldn't do that. Look where I am. I'm in heaven. Well, yeah. you can have an, you know, an external heaven and feel like hell inside. That's just how the mind works, right? That's our experience. I got to do an Easter sail. I, I'm in Kona. I'm on the big island. And I got to do an Easter sail. And it was amazing. Because I, I really wasn't thinking about anything except enjoying that moment of floating on the boat and checking out the wind thing and seeing how they were tacking the sail back and forth. You know, just, just having that experience um, without going into all of the stuff going on in my life and the to-do lists and everything else that we, that we love doing uh, yeah. as, human, as human nature. Um, but yeah, sometimes I'll go out on the sailboat. And next thing you know, I'm thinking about a million things I should have been doing except being out on the sailboat. <laughs> yep. It's like, whoa, you know, I guess that's where the mind wants to go right now. But I really want to be on the ocean and watch the sunset and swim with the dolphins and, you know, be in the moment. I don't want to be thinking about what I forgot to do today or is the dog okay? And, yeah. It's, it's, it's been really fun to learn the principles and um, I'm really excited. I was finally able to make it because uh, they're always 6 a.m. my time. And so this is, this is wonderful. Thank you. No, oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Well, I'm back in Hawaii again in June. I'm back with, I'm, I'm going to Maui this time. Uh, yes, I can see Maui from the big island. Oh, wow. So I'll well, wave at I'll, you. And I'll wave back. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lisa, and welcome. I'm glad you've been able to make it today. Thank you. So, Bonnie, is there a specific time we need to finish up, or can we just carry on? Um, if anyone, if you have anything additional to say, or if anyone else has questions, I'm happy to stay on with you. It, we're typically going in an hour, but I'm happy to stay on. Well, there's just something else in that story that Lisa mentioned I wanted to relay back because it just does go back to the whole thing about shouldn't I know better. Literally, okay, that that day on a chartered a sailing boat last March in March 2016. And, you know, on the south side of Oahu Island, and it's just this beautiful, beautiful Sunday, amazing weather, loving the day. And all of a sudden I got caught up in my thinking. And for a moment, well, for a few moments, in fact, I went into, I shouldn't feel bad here. What's going on? That was just an interesting thought that I had. And I did kind of live in that for a minute or two. And until I remembered, oh, I can feel like this anywhere. It's okay. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't mean anything that I suck that I'm now ruined 10 minutes of my amazing Sunday. It doesn't mean anything other than the fact that I'm having a human experience. And noticing that is what made it drop. Noticing that the source of my experience in that moment had nothing to do with anything other than the fact that I was having a human experience coming from my thinking right there and then. And it looked more real when I was tied on to thinking that I shouldn't feel like this. And when I saw the absurdity of that, that I I can feel bad, great anywhere. I went, oh, there you go again when being human and it dropped away. Seeing the source of that, seeing that literally I'm in the same boat as everybody else in the human race, that we're all as a part of the human condition going to go, you know, up and down. And there's no shouldn'ts or shoulds. It's all experience. And the, the best gig in town for me, and I'm amazed what I'm seeing more and more of, and you know, and keeping going deeper in this understanding is I'm, you know, I'm beyond grateful for what for what I'm seeing. Beyond what could have what I could have dreamt of was possible for me when Morgan to experience in life. So 
that's why I don't think I'll ever get bored or tired or ever want to stop sharing this. So thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for everyone for listening. Thank you so much, Wen. I really appreciate it. Do you want to let people know how to get in touch with you in case anyone wants to reach you? Yeah. Um, so I guess when this recording becomes public, there'll be um, a link up as well to my to my um, email. Um, don't look at my website because it's awful. It's going to be redeveloped, but I've been saying that for the last five years, and one day I'll get around to it. But I don't, you know, it doesn't make any difference. <laughs> to how things work so um you can find me on facebook um either just under my name win morgan w y n m o r g a n there aren't many of us in the world you'll find me um or my company name winning w y double n i n g w y double n i n g winning coaching and training um you can find me um do have an online presence um, and also that's on a Facebook corporate page. And my email is win at winning.co.uk. So I'll spell that. W-Y-N, so Whiskey Yankee November, at winning, Whiskey Yankee November, November, Indigo, November, whatever G is, gold, I don't know, dot co.uk. <laughs> Almost got the whole alphabet out there then with all of those wonderful letters and what it actually meant, um, but not quite. Thank, thank you so much. This thank was a wonderful, wonderful um, hour that we spent with you. And just um, to remind everyone, the next webinar is May 11th, same time, and it's with Rohini Ross. So I um, hope you can all join us. Oh, you're going to love that. Rohini's awesome. She's a, a dear friend and a fellow mentee of, of the Pranskin Associates program. And um, yeah, I recommend that. Yeah. Wholeheartedly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all for attending. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.